Get ready to be inspired by the great things happening in rural education. The Rural Scoop will bring you new ideas and innovative solutions. We'll dive into education issues and we'll highlight what's working in your rural communities. You will hear from a variety of educators, administrators, professionals, and others who will provide relevant and engaging content in each episode. And now, serving up the scoop, here's your host, Dr. Melissa Seydorf. Welcome back, Rural Scoop listeners, for part of a series of interviews that we're doing to highlight our Rural Teachers of the Year from across the country. And it is a privilege, really, to be able to hear what they're doing in their rural school communities to bring exciting content and experiences to their rural students. So we have a special guest with us today from Michigan, and we'll get into talking with her. But first, before we do that, I want to uh, introduce myself to you and then introduce my co-host for the series. Um, I am a rural superintendent in Arizona, and it's really exciting to know that not only in my school are rural students getting what they need to achieve and be successful later on in life, um, but it's just inspiring to hear from these rural teachers from across the country. And I know that you're going to get a lot of content from the teacher of the year that we're interviewing today. Um, my co-host is Ty White. Ty was the 21-22 ARSA Teacher of the Year, and he is currently the National Teacher of the Year for the National Rural Education Association. And additionally, he is the Teacher of the Year for the Arizona Education Foundation. So, Ty, after that introduction, <laughs> why don't you introduce yourself, and then you can uh, have the privilege of introducing our guest. So I really appreciate the way you said that, but I'm going to have to make an adjustment. And this is a hard one for me to let go. But actually, the NREA just crowned their new National Rural Teacher of the Year. That's true. They did. But she has not yet been crowned. So we're going to hold on to it for this last interview. (laughs) All right. I I appreciate that. I I am looking forward to us getting Jennifer Morris on here as well. Yes. (laughs) She's um, she's going to be a good representative for rural across the nation. Absolutely. So, yeah, I teach chemistry and Wilcox. I mentor my students that want to do authentic research. And it was kind of exciting. I actually got to share those stories this week at the National Rural STEM Summit. I know there's a lag between record and release, but I just I've got to shout that out, too, because it was a it really was a special event held in Flagstaff this year. So I, this year, have gotten to meet a, all the state teachers of the year. We, we call ourselves the cohort. And um, it's amazing to me how many of them are rural, but not any of them have as strong a voice as what I've heard from Nanette Hansen. Nanette is not afraid to remind people in the crowd that rural schools count too. And, and I don't get to use this word very often, but I get to introduce you all today to this youper. <laughs> from the Upper Peninsula, Michigan. I just, I've got to say that. There's not many chances I get to use it. So, Lynette, why don't you introduce yourself to our crowd? Hi, everyone. Thanks for that introduction. I absolutely am a born and bred youper, which is found in the Urban Dictionary. So, you know, it's a real <laughs> word. It just means that I live in the upper part of Michigan, which we have a special state, which has two parts. And I get to live in the Upper Peninsula. And we call the people that live below the bridge, the trolls, you know, like they have to cross the bridge. (laughs) It's a term of endearment. It's a term of endearment because, of course, we're all Michiganders, right? Um, I was born and raised in the UP. I went to Gladstone High School, graduated from there. And then I went to school at Northern Michigan University in Marquette, all found in the UP. And I received my elementary teaching degree there. And uh, I had my master's degree in administration. And I continue every year to uh, keep getting smarter and learning more and how I can best serve our students. So, Nanette, this is this is going to be entirely silly of me. I know that the audience can't see what you're doing. This is an audio podcast. 
But why don't you just describe that thing you do when you show people what the UP is? Well, because we have the unique two pieces, two peninsulas for Michigan. All Michiganders everywhere know that we use our left and right hand to represent the upper peninsula and then our um, uh, right hand to represent the lower peninsula, which kind of looks like a mitten. And we hold that up and people... You, well, if you know, you know. So you just hold it up and and then you point out where you live in our glorious state. And so you've seen it. People have seen I've, it. I've seen it. It's great. Like it seriously, is. the first time I watched you do it, I was trying to figure it out. And then when I saw like the thumbstick and I was like, oh, I get it. I get mm-hmm. it. Now. It's our map. It's our hand map, as a matter of fact. So you talk about growing up in Michigan. When did you realize you wanted to be a teacher? And how did you describe the process for that? Well, I always knew I wanted to help kids and make a difference in their lives. But it really became very clear when I was in school. Teachers that made connections with me and made me feel important and actually uncovered things in me that I hadn't seen in myself and sort of gave me that boost of confidence and said, you know, I really see that you would make an an excellent teacher. You have these potentials that that I think you could make a difference in people's lives. And the way they treated me, like I was important to them and that I was worth their time and their effort. And they would carve out times in their day to, you know, check in with me and see what I needed. I was thinking to myself, man, I could really do this for other kids for my life and make sure that they knew that someone was always in their corner. And, and I thought, man, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go make a difference in kids' lives. And I'm going to be that, that positive person that they see every single day. And I'm going to make a difference that way. Well, and Nanette, that, that I think is something that every teacher can connect with. We're here for kids, right? And, and as a teacher, you have choices in where you are going to do that, where you're going to connect with kids. So why did you choose rural? What keeps you in rural? Again, I, you know, born and bred, went to rural schools, rural universities, and I knew that our kids needed to have a, a passionate, exciting teacher in front of them and that they deserve the same opportunities that like urban areas have and, and opportunities to have teachers who love what they do, but also appreciated that small town feel and, and, and knew how to energize kids with the resources and materials that they have. And sometimes it's not always a lot. And so you have to sort of make the best of what you have. And I knew that our kids deserve that. And I wanted to make a difference here. I want to steer back to something you said, and I'm sorry to kind of take this conversation off a planned map, right? It's interesting you say that you had teachers who um who saw a teacher in you and saw a person that could be like that advocate for kids. And I think a lot of our our guests have shared a similar story to that. That there's some characteristic that you demonstrate and people see you as a teacher. I I guess I just want to value like I spent this week around some amazing teachers, some amazing people and like, I'm not trying to say anything bad. No one gets thrown under the bus. I value trades. No one says you'd make a great plumber. No one says you make a great electrician. I think we want a part of this podcast series is I think it's special to take a moment and just celebrate and think about what has made you such a successful teacher and, and how you came to this profession that way. Because I think that's a part of the equation that's missing from our pipeline for creating teachers. Well said, Ty. Absolutely. I think that building relationships is really the cornerstone of education, don't you? I think that if kids know that you're in their corner, they're going to work so much harder. They're going to feel so much safer. You're building a culture of community and love. And I teach first grade. So of course, I'm getting I'm getting to start at the beginning of their K-12 experience. I get to, to embed that love of learning. I want them to be excited. And I want them to, when they enter those doors, to know that I, me as their 
biggest cheerleader is there to support them in whatever they're going to do, whoever they're going to become. And I want them to know that at the end of the day, it's not the academics. It's not all of that. It's that they know they are valued. They're seen that I think across the board that they are going to be successful in whatever they attempt to do. And so that's, I think is really important. I think that kids need to know that from day one, when they walk into a building. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Now I see what they thought on you, right? Like that's, that's wonderful. So tell us about the school you teach in. And I mean, is you, you teach first grade. What's the school name? Lemmer Elementary in Escanaba Public Schools. This is my 18th year teaching first grade there. I haven't always taught there. I taught alternative high school for um, several years in the UP. And that is a whole different thing than first grade. And then I also taught in Curtis, Michigan, which is a very small little rural town in the Upper Peninsula, where I wore many, many hats. But now I've landed for the last 18 years in first grade, which is actually the love of my life. I love teaching kids how to read. Uh, they're excited to come to school. They love their first grade teacher. They want to learn new <laughs> things. And uh, our district really prioritizes our kids getting the things that they need. And uh, when we were in the global pandemic and everyone was scrambling to have the right sort of technology and you think rural, uh oh, our our district really prioritized getting every child some sort of device in their hand, helping uh, families make sure that they could get online. You know, I walked to many corners and said, leave your Chromebook out. I'll get you logged in. I'll help you figure out how to you know, navigate these things these things. And so in my district, Escanaba schools, I am so lucky that they know what's best for kids and they prioritize that. And so that's why I love working there. And that's why I love teaching first grade there. Maybe we should be coming to work with you. I've been inviting <laughs> everyone to come to Arizona. Come anytime you want. It's going to get chilly in the winter. Well, okay. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I can't do the snow. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll leave that to you. We'll leave that to you. So beyond the pandemic, which was a very challenging time for teachers across the country, we know that teaching in rural communities often has unique challenges and and also opportunities. Um, what are some of the challenges that you faced in your in your school or within your district or community that you've encountered? And how have you dealt with it? What have you done to overcome those challenges? That's a wonderful question. Uh, I'm like I just spoke of my district really prioritizes troubleshooting those things that sometimes we fall short in uh, rural areas. What I see, our kids don't have access to the same sort of opportunities that kids in urban areas have. And Ty spoke earlier about, you know, talking about a plumber and all of these things. And I'm glad he brought that up because I noticed that in our rural areas in the UP, that we don't have the same opportunities for CTE programs that other people, even downstate uh, Michigan, have. And I realized that many of our very teeny tiny districts are islands. They don't have the opportunity to be bused to a hub where they could be taught CTE skills, or they don't have a big enough school where they can house their own auto, uh, you know, auto mechanic thing, or they don't have, you know, a machine shop. They don't have any of those facilities. And so our kids are missing out on those opportunities. And, and so this year as the Michigan teacher of the year, I really went down to our board of education and I really shared with them the uh the it's not the shortcomings but the opportunities that are missed for our kids up here and that we need to really find a way to equalize the the playing field because i really believe in cte and i everyone's not going to go on the university college track i need someone to be able to fix my car and know the inner workings of plumbing and electric electrical and all of those things and 
our kids are not getting the opportunities. And so what can we do to redraw district lines, funnel more money? How can we change uh, you know, the equation that we use when we are allocating money and all of these things. And so I know that at our state level that they are looking into those opportunities and try to level the playing field. And I think that's the very least we could do for our students because they deserve to have those same opportunities. Well, and then that what's interesting about that is those types of programs really are a workforce development opportunity for those communities, because if students have the skills that they can put in place within the community, they don't leave. Right. And many of them want to stay. And oftentimes you have a first generation uh, student who who whose parents didn't go to college or maybe they did they learned a trade or maybe none of the above and they need those opportunities available to them and many you know they can get them paid for while they're in school they can right. follow a pipeline and 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 you know emerge from high school oftentimes with certificates and and all of these valuable work for skills and so those were things that i noticed uh you know many little islands rural islands, so to speak, uh, that we need to sort of level the playing field for our kids so that they have the same opportunities as ever everyone else. Well said. You know, I before we go on, I just, you really have stood out as a teacher of the year representing all the teachers in your state. And maybe part of that comes from, you said you served as an alternative high school teacher, right? But um. To be a first grade teacher and to recognize some of those missing secondary CTE opportunities, that's valuable. Um, that's, think- that's really a great thing to contribute, like we said, for the communities in place. Yeah, we need we need to we need to have that long term vision of where our kids are going. And we know everyone's not going to college and we know everyone's not going to do X, Y, or Z. We, we, we need to have opportunities and we have to make sure that they're sustainable. Right. So if you if you have a CTE program, you're going to make sure that it's sustainable for those kids for generations to come so that everybody's getting an opportunity. Yeah. So we all hear about rural teachers and leaders wearing many hats. What else do you do in your school community besides teaching in the classroom? Well, I am a firm believer in teacher uh, recruitment and teacher retention, and I am a mentor, and I take that job very seriously in in my school. I want to make sure that kids that are in my school have passionate teachers who love to teach and love who they teach, and so I think it's very important for me as a veteran teacher to to instill sort of that love of teaching in in our new teachers also support them because when we come in as new teachers, sometimes we are, you know, barely keeping our head above water and teaching is a, is a profession that you have to love and that you have to remember that in the back of your head on those days that you're barely keeping your head above water. So that's one of the things that I do that is outside of, uh, of just teaching that I think is super important to make sure that we get those passionate teachers to stay in the profession Another thing I do, I'm a first grade team leader. Uh, you know, I organize our uh, curriculum get togethers and make sure that we're staying together. And that's a lot where I was mentoring three girls last year and uh, I'm no longer their mentor because they reached their three year mark. But of course, they're still in my room every single day and <laughs> we're talking uh, about what's best for kids. Um, I also sit on the leader in me team as a teacher leader. Uh, that is the seven principles of a, uh, you know, a great student. And we are a lighthouse team. So that means that we are leaders in what we do and teaching kids those seven healthy habits. And uh, I think those being a well-rounded teacher includes doing more than just teaching in front of kids. It's helping teachers be their best selves, creating that culture of of everyone is welcome, making sure that all stakeholders in the community, in the school community, every the janitor, the lunch people, everybody feels like they're a cohesive part of the team and can make a difference 
in our, our, our kids' lives. And, and so I think that's something that I really strive for as a teacher. So Sounds- I, I'm not going to take that away from you, but I want to, I want to follow that up. How do you, um, how do you handle it when you have a, a teacher come in or maybe they're approaching retirement and they're just sort of, uh, they're just overwhelmed or, or they're checked out or they're, what do you do to re you said recruitment and retention. How do you re-inspire people? I do think that that's a great question because, you know, we've all been, I've been burned out. I, I'll tell you what, after this year of Michigan Teacher of the Year, I've never been so rejuvenated in all my life because I got to talk to all those pre-service teachers at the colleges and, and, and they, they just energize you. And I think what you need to do is you just need to go to those teachers who you see are struggling and you need to have a private conversation and, and, to, and, and ask them, are you okay? What, because we remember, Outside of the school day, we're human beings too. And so we really have to get to the root of what's happening because it can be a combination of things. And so uh, to your question, I, I've i made it my point to, to really just give everybody in my school a warm hug. I want them all to know that I'm open to whatever they need. If they need an, you know somebody to talk to about something in school or out of school, and remember, we're a small district, so that can happen. And I, I just want uh, them to know that uh, the te- that at one point in time, they love teaching. And what was it that they loved? And are they so far away from that? Or is it other things that are throwing them off? And a lot, you know, a lot of times people are saying it might be their administration. It might be, be the laws that are coming down. It might be, you know, a, a false narratives that are in the news and all of these things that weigh on teachers today. And I think having an open dialogue, because remember, mental health, student mental health, teacher mental health, it's just as important. And, and you know, in rural communities, we don't have a lot of outside facilities sometimes. And so lending that helpful ear, I think is just as important as, you know, being, you know, having an opportunity to talk to someone professionally. I hope that answered the question. No, that's great. Now let's take a short break to hear from our sponsor. Thank you to Trainual for sponsoring The Rural Scoop. Trainual is the number one software for process documentation and employee manuals. It puts everything into one simple, searchable system that is easy to navigate, is clearly organized, and is simple to access. It's perfect for schools and even entire school systems. Trainual can also help your continuation plans as well. For example, your chemistry teacher can log how they've organized the storage room, making it easier for the next person who takes that job. Listeners of The Rural Scoop get 10% off their first 12 months by using offer code RURALSCOOP. When you sign up for your free trial, just enter Rural Scoop one word, as a promo code, and it'll automatically apply. Just go to trainual.com to get started. So, Nanette, what does the expression rural advantage mean to you? It's something that we have asked all of our toys our teachers of the year. And it's really interesting what they really um, like about being in a rural community or a rural school setting. So what does that term rural advantage mean to you? I think the term rural advantage means to me that, remember, born and bred, small rural town, it means that community. It means that our kids know their principal. They know all of their teachers. They know their superintendent. They see them out at Meyer or Walmart. Or they see them around town. They know that they live in that community where their uh, teachers, principals, superintendents are. Um, I get, I like I mentioned earlier, I get the wonderful opportunity to start my kids' K-12 journey. I teach first grade. So I get to watch them all the way till they go out the door and graduate. As a matter of fact, the real advantage is I went out to have some blood work done and I had my first grade grader taking my 
of course she was 22 now. She <laughs> was taking my blood and she said, you know what, Mrs. Hansen, you're still my favorite teacher. I'm out of college and you're still the, the my favorite person ever. And she said, you just made me feel like I was an important person in your classroom and you you had fun and you were funny. And I just loved all the things that we did. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, this small town, I got to make this huge impact. And look at this gal. She is, you know, she's in the medical profession. She remembers me fondly. She remembers her time in school fondly. She remembers that beginning as a great start to her K-12 ed- and beyond education. And I think that's what the rural advantage is. The rural advantage is making a difference and that building that beautiful culture and community and that and that impact just keeps going on and on and, and you just never know when it stops. And, and that's what it means to me. Nanette, I really relate to that. When I was talking with the Rural Schools Collaborative, that was a big part of what I thought being rural meant was the way communities are tied together like that. This next question is probably the the biggest softball we've got for you. Big old meatball served right over the plate. Give us a moment from your teaching career that was like your aha moment, something that you're really just proud of. And you've already told us about your first grader drawing blood. So now you got to share another one with us. Well, I would say that my proudest moments are always building and creating those positive, safe classroom communities and having that time with my kids that where they feel that they're safe, that they're seen, that they're loved, that they know that they're valued and important and that I am their biggest cheerleader and that they can go out and conquer whatever things that they want to do. Um, One of the best things that I uh, ever did as a teacher was, it was an alternative high school, and I had a, a student who, let's just say he wasn't thrilled to be there because I was 22, 23, and he was about 18. So we were very close in age, and he's thinking, who is this person, you know, elementary school teacher at the high school level? And what is she going to do to help me? And and I tell you, I worked extra hard that year to build a safe relationship, a space where he would feel like he would be accepted and not judged. And at one point, he had gotten in trouble for fighting and he had to go in front of the tribunal, which was their system of deciding if kids get to stay or leave. And he had an opportunity to ask a staff member to represent him at their tribunal. And he asked me. And this was a person who, I mean, when I say he didn't want to be there, I mean, there were a lot of expletives every day when he came in my room. He was filling the swear jar with lots of money. And um, and so I was like, absolutely, I would be happy to represent you. And then when that was all over and he did get to stay, he said to me, he sort of marched over to me and he said, I have something to ask you. And I was like, all right, you can ask me. And he said, "Uh, why? I said, what do you mean? Why? He said, why did you do it? Why did you represent me? I said, well, Ty, somebody when I was in high school made me feel like they were going to be there for me, no matter what, no matter if I was successful or not successful, they were going to be there waiting for me to catch me if I, if I needed it. And I said to myself at the beginning of this year, I'm going to be here for you no matter when you need me. And 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 it happened. And that's why I was there. And he said, well, thanks anyway. And that was the end of it. And, at you know, I I wish I could say it was smooth sailing after that, but it wasn't. But that impact that I had on that student who I thought really did not like me made all the difference to me as an educator really solidified that need for human contact, safe relationships, and community. So Nanette, that really leads into the next question that I'm going to ask you, because you were connecting with those students. And that's that's the one of the reasons you're a rural teacher. It's been something that's echoed through all of the, the time that we've spent talking. What would you tell future educators that are looking 
to figure out where they're going to teach that might push them into a rural setting? Well, I would say you can be a change agent anywhere. And the community that you can build in a rural area, it, it's you, you can't compare it to anything. Uh, kids know that they are supported by you. They know the people that work in the restaurants. They know the people that work at the grocery stores. You can call them at any time and use their expertise in your classroom. If I wanted to contact the the, the local newspaper or the radio station to come and talk to my kids about their profession, they would be there in a second. And so for, for future teachers, you can be a change agent anywhere, but you can make such an impact in rural communities across the nation and make a difference in kids' lives every day by using your expertise in a place that it's so truly needed. And it will come back to reward you tenfold. So Nanette, I follow you on social media. Like I think you're an outstanding teacher. I love the stuff you post, but I saw you just posted a picture of a, a page. The first lady sent out. And one of the things at the bottom asked about the things you're up, like, I want to, I want you to tell us some more. Cause I think a picture doesn't do it justice. What are the things that you're most looking forward to this year? Well, if Dr. Joe Biden and CCSSO sends you mail and they ask you to talk about the um, things that you're most optimistic about and post it on social media, well, then you do that. So the things that I wrote on that little bit of homework were, of course, and I'll go back and I said it throughout this whole entire podcast and I believe it in my heart, is building relationships, positive, safe, relationships for your students at the very earliest ages. I, I'm so optimistic every single year that I get to go into a classroom and be that person for those kids coming in. So they know that we're going to have fun and we're going to learn and I'm there for them. And I want to build them up and let them know that they are valuable people that have value to offer to the world. And building those classroom communities come First to me, I think, again, I'll say, I think it's the cornerstone of education, building those communities and those relationships so that we have lifelong lovers of education. We build them into the people that they're going to become, and we want them to feel confident and happy about those things. And so those are things that I'm most optimistic about and look forward to every single year uh, going back into the classroom. So, Nanette, is there anything that we haven't touched on that you want to make sure that you're sharing out about either your rural school community or about what you're looking forward to as you step into Michigan Teacher of the Year? Well, as a matter of fact, I'm just ending my Teacher of the Year uh, role, and they have awarded the new teacher, Candace Jackson, uh, for Michigan. She will be going on. But as a uh, as the Michigan Teacher of the Year, I learned that it's so really critical to advocate for the things that you see that need changing. And I didn't realize how political teaching was until I was in this role. And you know what? I'm using my voice now and forevermore to level the playing field for my kiddos and kiddos in rural America, that they deserve to have those opportunities, the same opportunities and the same experiences that everybody else has. And so that's one thing that I want to say. Always remember to advocate, advocate, advocate. If you see a, a need that needs to be filled, try to figure out how to do it. It's true. If we don't tell our stories of rural education, then they won't know the great things that are happening out there. You know, that's such an important sentiment. And, and it's so true. Teaching is political. It's not partisan, but it determined. I, I really wish I could remember the author. I read an outstanding piece that politics determines who belongs. And teachers, like you said, through those relationships and how we treat our students, signify to everybody who belongs in our classrooms and whose voice counts. 
Mm-hmm. Good quote. Good quote. Absolutely. Everybody belongs. I agree. Everybody counts. Well, Nanette, it's been a pleasure being able to talk with you and learn more about your school community and your experience as Michigan's Teacher of the Year. So thanks for spending time with us. Thanks for having me. I really had a great time. We'll see you soon. Thank you so much for listening to The Rural Scoop. Please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe, or even leave us a comment. And be sure to follow on Twitter at Dr. Sadorf. That's D-R underscore S-A-D-O-R-F so that you never miss a new release. You can also check out previous episodes of The Scoop wherever you get your podcasts. Production support for The Rural Scoop is provided by Chattanooga Podcast Studios. Find out more at ChattanoogaPodcastStudios.com. See you next time for more great discussions about rural education.